the background of that song, What Child Is This? It was, it was uh, written by William Dix in 1865. Mr. Dix was an insurance salesman, and he came down with a very weird illness that uh, made him bedridden. And in that bedridden state that he was in, in his sickness, he became very depressed. In depression, he, uh, he was almost suicidal. And he was started to read the Word of God and tried to get out of his funk by, by just reading the Word. And he became very spiritual that time. And the Christmas time of 1865, he penned these words of this song. It was taken out of a larger poem of the, 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 the manger throne. But these words are so deep. They're so good. We think about babies, and we think about these cuddly little babies, and you go to the hospital, and you see all these little babies. Matter of fact, you know, in the last four weeks, let's just take four weeks, if you've had a baby, well, let's go the last two months. Let's go two months. Let me include everybody. In the last two months, if you have had a baby, would you please stand up if you had a baby in the last four months? We had, I think we've had one, two, three, four. I think I've counted from the church in the last two months, we've had eight babies born in two months here at the church. And you know what's really neat is, is you go in there and you see this little baby and, and they're so cute and cuddly. And, and the first baby is always, oh, we're going to take care of the baby. Everything's wonderful, great. We're going to put a protection, a bubble around it and, and everything's going to be nice. And as the babies grow and they turn into adults and it's just awesome to see little babies. It's awesome to see the parents take care of these little babies. You know, the birth worldwide, there's 131 million babies born every year. In the United States, 4 million are born every year. 360,000 babies a day, 15,000 an hour, 250 a minute, and there are four babies born every second. The most common date for a birth date you know what the most common date is? Everybody's going, yell yeah, out your birthday. It's May 31st. No. If you are born on September 16th, anybody on here September 16th? September 16th is the most popular birth date. There's more babies born on September 16th than any other date. But the most popular month is August. Anybody born in August? That's the most popular month. Most common days to be born are on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The worst common date is because the doctors don't work is Sunday. <laughs> no baby's born on Sunday unless it's an emergency. And that's probably mostly because of scheduling. So when you think about babies, think about what child is this. Could you imagine Mary looking at that child and, and knowing because of the angel who this child was? But I'm thinking about something, not about necessarily what child is this, but could you imagine the Joseph's mindset to looking at this child. Could you imagine Joseph's mindset even before the child came into existence? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she is still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is neat. Joseph her fiancé was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. He considered this, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived of the Holy Spirit. And in this, last, this next verse, what child is this? And she will have a son, and you call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The purpose of Jesus is to die. The purpose of Jesus, the purpose of the virgin birth, the purpose of living 33 years, the purpose of what child is this? All of the correct to be fulfilled, the Lord's message throughout the prophet. Look, this is Isaiah, look. The prophet, look, the virgin will conceive a child, and she will be born of a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Jesus, the baby, wrapped in swaddling clothes, 
the swaddling clothes is the same clothes that, that they put on to, to bury somebody. It's just strips of cloth that they, they would almost mummify somebody. So the baby Jesus was in swaddling clothes. Dead Jesus was in swaddling clothes. God with us. God, wrapped up in human flesh, came to this earth for us. God with us. When you think about Joseph, be able to understand what Joseph was thinking, to understand the power that this has taken place. For 400 years, it has been quiet, and now all of a sudden God is going to step out of eternity and come into our life. What does that do for us? Joseph is saying, I don't know. The woman that I love, the woman that I was engaged to is having an affair. I, I'm just going to put her away. I, I, I love her, and I don't want to embarrass her. I don't want to hurt her feelings, but it's embarrassing to me. And because of that, God looked at his heart, and he pondered on these things, and he came, stepped out of eternity, and came down, and he spoke to Joseph in a dream. And he said, Joseph, believe Mary. What she has told you is true. She is pregnant, and she is pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I need you to marry her, because the most important job that we have of all time is coming to this point. And you have been chosen to be the father of our little baby Jesus. Be the father of God. And when he is born, I need you to call him Jesus. Because this baby that is going to be born is God. And this baby is God with us. And this baby is going to save all mankind from their sin. You know, what a struggle that would be. What an event in life that would be. You would call that a very pivotal time in Joseph's life. What does he do with this information? Did he have too much pizza last night? Was that a real dream? Did this stuff real take place? What am I doing with what is in front of me? God will allow events in our life to strengthen us every day. Um, I want to give you some ideas, some, some counseling on, on life around the Christmas time. There will be events that will surprise us, but will never be surprised by God. God is never surprised at what takes place in your life. God is not up in heaven fearful of what is taking place within your life because God is in, in control of everything that takes place within your life. I heard this quote, God has a great plan for my life. Even though I may not always understand how, I know my life events are not a surprise to him. He will work out every detail to my advantage. It is his perfect timing. Everything is under his control. Everything is under God's control. Joseph said, I, I had nothing to do with this. My life has been turned over. I love my wife, my fiance. And now all this is taking place. I'm being laughed at. I'm being ridiculed in the community. And what am I going to do? And the same thing that Mary had to do. When the angel appeared to her, she said, if that's what you want, Lord, permit it to be. They knew that they were going to be laughed at. They knew that they're not going to be believed. Oh, yeah, you're a virgin and you're pregnant? <laughs> right. Where's that at in the almanac of medical history? It doesn't take place. There are no consequences. In fact, there's only used one time in the Bible where consequence would really take place. And it's found in Luke chapter 10, verse 31. By chance, a priest came alongside. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed on the other side of the road and passed by him. Consequences don't take place. Consequences in our life never happen. Our life, our steps are ordered by the Lord. Jesus said, a, Jesus said and by coincidence, he said, he said, I examined that. I knew what was going to take place. What appears to be random, chance of fact, 
overseen by a sovereign God who knows the number of hairs on your head. He understands that he looks under the dove and he understands every bird in the air. There are no consequences in life. The Bible definition of consequence would be what occurs together by God's providential arrangement of circumstance. So when you're sitting around, just like Joseph was sitting around and said, what's going on? I don't understand. I don't know what to do. I, I'm scared. I don't think God is in this. What we have to do is we have to understand everything that takes place. We have to understand what does God want for us. We may not understand why. We may not understand how to go through it. But what we can do is get on our knees before God and say, God, help me understand. Help me understand what I need to do and how I need to go through it. We classify life events as important or sometimes very unimportant. And we think that God cares about the important, but God uses the very unimportant things to allow the important things to take place. If we don't trust God in the unimportant, the very non-essentials, sometimes God will not give to us what he ultimately wants us to do, the importance. So what we must do, and we have our mindset, well, if it's a big thing, I'll pray about it. I'll talk to somebody about the big thing. But if it's nothing, God, God is too busy for the little things. God only cares about the big things. The Bible says we should pray about everything. There's nothing about our life. There's not about a decision that we shouldn't take before God and say, God, what do you want me to do here? How do I want this to take place? We have to understand God is in charge of every issue within our life. God loves us, and he wants to work with us. But the second thing is God wants us to think before we do. Anybody, <laughs> you're, you're, I'm going to get in trouble here. Anybody talk before you think sometimes? Somebody give me an amen. Sometimes we, we hear something, we react, bam. And you're thinking, what in the world did I just do? What did I just say? I, I, I can't get those words back. They, and then they hurt, they, they scar. And here's what Joseph did. Verse 19 and 20. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Verse 20. And he considered this. He considered this. You know what that word means? He pondered. He thought. He evaluated. He looked at the pros and looked at the cons. He didn't just get mad. He, his spirit was the same. He had that gentle spirit. And in counseling, if, you're, if you've gone to any of my counseling, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redo a, a, a counseling session. It's talking about relationships. And uh, there are always expectations in any relationship. When your expectation and your behavior do not match up, there's a gap. Okay? Expectation, this is what I expect to do. Behavior, this is what I did. And in the middle, there's a decision that we have to make. There are two things that you can choose. You can choose to expect the worst, okay? Expectation, this is behavior. You're, at, you're late again. You didn't pay the bill. Where have you been? You're spending too much money. Everything turns into a negative. You expect the worst because my expectation and my behavior has a gap. I'm going to expect the worst. I'm going to tell you the worst. I'm going to tell you why you did something, how you did it, what you need to do wrong. And guess what? We're going to get to fight about it. It's going to last two weeks because you never do what you tell me you're going to do. And you expect the worst, and you get in the fight, and you start hitting each other in the head. And you know what? The week before and the week after Christmas is the bam time. Everybody gets in a fight. There's all kinds of issues. You paid too much for that, or you paid too, we're too late. How many times do we have to go to Christmas? How many dinners are we going to have to go to? It's family conflict. So we have expectation, we have our behavior, and we expect the worst. Or... We can believe the best. The gap is in the middle. Either we can go negative when something doesn't take place, or we can stay positive and believe the best. I know. I'm sorry. I'm running 15 minutes late, and I know that you were supposed to be there. 
I apologize. I will call Forrest. Oh, you didn't pay the bill? I know, it's been hectic around here. I'll pay the bill tomorrow morning. When somebody takes place and we have a behavior or expectation and there's a gap and we did not meet that expectation, do we go negative and accept, expect the worst or can we believe the best? Positive relationships, gap, believe the best. They even make up generous excuses for why somebody did not live up to that expectation. They love their spouse, they love the person enough that they are going to make positive excuses for why things fail. Love is truly blind. If there's a gap in a relationship, you have a choice to make. And it's a choice that each one of us make, and Joseph even made that choice. It's, am I going to put her away privately, or am I going to believe the best? I'm going to marry her and do what I'm supposed to do. When we make those choices in life, happy people, kind people. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her. He chose to believe the best. And in your relationships, when you believe the best, when something takes place, and you have to make a choice in your mind instantaneously. It's, am I going to assume the worst? Am I going to think worst case scenario? Am I going to get upset before I even know the scenario? Or am I going to say, you know what? There's a reason. I'm going to listen to the reason. Now, there may be times that we have to have some hard questions. And we may have to have some deep conversations. But I need to believe the best. In every person. I have to assume that they are not out to hurt me. They love me. I have to assume that they're not trying to do something against me. I have to believe the best. And if I can believe the best, just like Joseph believed the best, then that happens, we have a better relationship. And then the third thing, God sent Jesus to sacrifice for us. This is the, this is the reason. What child is this? What child is this? This child... This baby wrapped in swaddling clothes? What child is this? Verse 21. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Do you know why? Do you know why the world is against Christmas? Do you know why the world wants to put X Christmas? Do you know why? They're not believers. They don't believe this. But what we must do, it is not Walmart's job to say Merry Christmas. It is not Homeland's job to say Merry Christmas. They're not mandated by God to evangelize the world. Do you know who is? That's my job. Why should I get mad at somebody that sells something to me that they didn't say Merry Christmas and they're not even a believer? It is the job of the church, the mandate that God sent his son to die for the world for me as a believer to say Merry Christmas. It's my Christmas. It's my Lord. God's with me. Let us stand firm and not be swayed. It doesn't make any difference what the world does. The world didn't love Jesus. They're not going to love you. You love Jesus. You love God. You. You are the mandate. You are the one who should say Merry Christmas. In the phrase, what child is this? Good Christians fear for sinners here. The silent word is pleading. Nails, spears shall pierce him through. The cross he bore for me. And for you, hail, hail the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. Nails and spears. We're talking about a baby. We're talking about a little baby that can't do anything. And the angels are worshiping him. The shepherds are guarding him. And we're singing the song about a little baby at Christmas time. And everybody is, oh, it's so cute. Babies are so awesome, and they are. This baby, born in just the right time, for just this purpose, 
We worship this little baby because it's cute. But this little baby ended up dead for you and I. What child is this? This is God's only begotten son. Salvation is only through the name of Jesus Christ. We worship Jesus. We worship him. We pray to him. But you know the most important thing that Jesus does for us? He saves us. Let me give you just a, free, a few verses and write these verses down if you want. Acts chapter 4, 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other name. This baby Jesus was ordained by God himself from the beginning of time since sin entered into this world to die on the cross and he had to come into this world. So there's no other name that we can get our salvation from except through Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and that man is Christ Jesus. The mediator. The only way that Jesus can be our mediator is if he died on the cross. The baby had to die in order to be our mediator, and he is our advocate going up to God. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And listen to this verse. This is, I think this next verse is probably the most powerful verse in the Bible. The most powerful verse in the Bible. If you want to stand and you want to communicate with somebody about Jesus and the wrath of God, John chapter 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. If you believe, you got the love of God. If you do not believe in Jesus, you have the wrath of God. The contrast. And Jesus is the mediator. He's right in the middle. Jesus is our salvation. In John chapter 8, 24, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins if you believe not that I am he who you shall die in your sins. We have to have Jesus as our mediator. He is our only salvation. What child is this? What child is this that Mary is holding? It is the very son of God. It is the mediator. It is our salvation. It is our way to reconcile to God. It's not just a baby. It's not something we just sing songs to. Christmas is about redemption. Christmas is about Jesus, God in the flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and died. Wow. Christmas isn't about the Christmas presents. The best Christmas that we have is the Christmas that we can fall on our knees before God and say, God, thank you. Thank you for what you have done for me. You know, on Christmas Eve, we're having our, our Christmas Eve candlelight Lord's Supper. Talking about Jesus being born and Jesus dying. The bread and blood of Jesus being broken and spilled out for our sins. There's not a better way to say, thank you, Lord, than to consecrate our hearts and our lives, to examine our hearts and our lives and say, at this event, I want to honor you more than anything else. I want to bow my knees. I want to submit to you, and I want to love you, and I want to give to you not only my heart, my life, but everything about me because I know I have nothing without you. The only way that we have anything is through our relationship with Jesus Christ through the birth. Number four, God will expect us to submit. Verse 24, when, Jesus woke, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her, his son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Everything that the angel commanded Joseph to do, he woke up and he did. Submit. What does submit mean? Submit means to obey, to put under, be subject to, submit oneself unto. In marriage, we'd say, <laughs> wives, submit to your husbands. Yeah. Mutual submission in marriage is this. I submit to you. You submit to me. Mutual submission is putting yourself under each other. It's not the boss. The man's in charge. 
Woman, give me some coffee. Woman, do this. Woman, do that. <laughs> that happens a lot, doesn't it? Mutual submission is I submit. I personally humble myself and put underneath. God will expect us to submit. When we arrange ourselves into divine viewpoint, then living according to God's law and not man's law. In the flesh, in the arrogance, we submit to no one. I'm in charge. When we gave our life to Jesus, we have no right to be in charge. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Husbands, even so, likewise, submit yourselves unto your wife. Even as Christ, we do this out of the respect and the reverence of Jesus Christ. I submit to God first. And if I am not willing to submit to God, I will not submit to anyone else. Humility has to take place. In James chapter 4, verse 7, So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Humble yourselves before God. It means put God where he needs to be. If you put God where he needs to be in your life, you'll be able to resist the devil. If you do not humble yourself before God, you're saying, I can handle this. You are not humble. You are not resisting anything. You are saying, bring it on. I don't need help. I got this on my own. And God is saying, you cannot resist the temptations of this world unless you humble yourselves under God. In 1 Peter 5.5, 5, in the same way, who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. And all of you, dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud. If anybody would walk up and they think that they are smarter than everybody else, they have all the answers, you know what? What, what, what do you automatically do? You flip the switch. Go talk to somebody else. But if somebody walks up to you Humble. Say, hey, can we talk about something? We will talk to people all day long that have a, a humbled art idea, a humbled heart, because they've been with God. Just because we're intelligent, just because you know something, doesn't mean that you have the answers. You, when you have the answers, is when you humble yourself and you go before God, and God gives you a quiet spirit, a just spirit, that we can talk to God. And God will give us the direction that we need to go within our life. But this last, God opposes the proud. He opposes it. He stiff arms it. He says, you know what? I don't even want to talk to you until you humble, until you submit. And once you submit, once you get on your knees before me, once you say, I need help, I'm hurt, then he says he will give grace to the humble. Joseph had to do this. Joseph had humble himself and say, I will do what the angel asked me to do. I will take Mary as my wife. I'm going to take her as my wife, and I'm going to name him Jesus. Because the baby that stands before me, the baby that I'm going to change his dirty diapers, the baby that I'm going to teach to walk, the baby I'm going to teach the trade to, is not a mere baby. It is God in the flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it's not just a little baby. What child is this, you may ask? This is God's divine plan to redeem you of your sins. So Christmas, on Christmas morning, when the kids are unwrapping the presents, wow. Is that what Christmas is all about? Is Christmas about the lights that we go to and the shows that we watch and the songs that we sing? Is that what Christmas is all about? Is Christmas about the family time and all these things are great, but what we as believers have been called to do is to take Jesus into the world. Take him into the world and not be ashamed. Those that oppose Jesus, that's okay. Jesus loves me. Those that ridicule even the existence of Jesus, that's okay. 
That's okay. Because what is this child? Who is this child? God with us. Emmanuel. He is taking the sins of this world upon his back. In the right time, in just the right time, Jesus said, now. Now is the plan. And we are recipient of God's divine plan. We, we have the privilege of accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We have the privilege of experiencing the grace of God. We get the privilege of experiencing eternity because of God. Jesus, Jesus, this little baby that Mary is holding, is having in a manger, this little Jesus, He's my Lord. Lord. That means prominent, preeminent, first. Lord. Oh, Jesus. When He's our Lord, we have no problem with worshiping. If we look at Jesus as a little baby that we can tell jokes about and We can sit and give gifts to other people because it's his birthday. It's just going to be another Christmas. But when we look at this and understand what child this is, we look at Christmas, there's no problem with talking to people about what my Lord has done for me and who this little baby is. Between behavior and expectation, there's a choice. My expectation is, is to honor God every day. My behavior sometimes falls short. My goal, my desire, is to follow after Christ. But you know when I do not do what God tells me to do sometimes, do you know what he always does for me? He believes the best. He always forgives me. He always trusts me. He always gives me another chance. My Lord knows my heart. He does not assume the worst. He does not throw me away. He believes the best. And when we haven't failed him, I'm sorry, when we have failed him, he wants to forgive us. That's what Christmas Eve service is going to be about. Christmas Eve service. We're going to sing some songs, and Tim's going to come up here with the kids, and Rachel's going to play a game with the kids, and Ben and Al is going to share a little bit about the blood and about the body of our broken Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're going to ask the entire church family to examine their heart. To examine their heart to make sure that they are where they need to be spiritually. And when they are where they are spiritually, then they're going to take a cup and a piece of bread and go back to their aisles. And after we have prayed, after we've examined ourselves, it should be a very holy intimate, respectful time of celebrating Jesus. Not only his birth, but his death. Oh, I left a very important part out. In celebrating his birth, we're going to have a manger here. And we're asking everyone to give Jesus a gift from our heart. A Christmas gift. His birthday. In doing so, when we give him his gift, we represent his birth. And after we pray and take our elements, we're going to represent his death. And when we do that, we should have a pure heart before him. It's his birthday. What child is this? What child is this? This is God. And he's here for us. And he wants to save you, love you, and forgive you.